went to a play the other night. Rosemary and the boys and I went to go see Guys and Dolls. Great story. The story's been around for 60, 70 years. Never had seen Guys and Dolls before. Play, movie, Frank Sinatra was in the movie back in, what, 52, 53? Never had seen the show, went to go see it. Great show. <coughs> During this show, you've got, of course, because it's a musical, you've got uh, the song, Luck Be a Lady Tonight, which is a song that Sinatra made famous. Um, but the best part about going to any play versus going to a movie, because it's going and hearing a story nonetheless. The best part about going to a play versus going to a movie is the intermission. The fact that there's a break in the middle of the story, I would argue, my friends, is one of the greatest inventions that mankind has ever made in the history of entertainment. The fact that you've got, in a play, a story that rises to a crescendo, and then it stops right there, and it says, stop for 15 minutes, go out, grab some popcorn, go to the lavatory, talk, to your friends, to the people who you've come with about the story so far, and by the way, that's not it. Now come back in after 15 minutes and we've got more to share with you. That intermission is a chance to savor in a play what you don't get in a movie. It's a chance to savor the story that you've heard so far, to be able to compare notes with the people that you're with, to be able to, as I said with the kids, pause for a minute and just relish what it is that you've experienced so far. With the exception of, I remember the movie Patton had an intermission in it. I think the movie Reds. How many of you guys remember that movie from back in the uh, days of cro Magnon, right? I think those are the two examples that I can think of of movies that actually had an intermission. They don't have many. You sit for two hours, 15 minutes, straight through, and you're out the door, and then you have to go talk about the movie. You have to savor it after everything is done. So that intermission is crucial. The story is not over at the end of Act 1. There is more to see, more to hear, more to do, and then you go back in for Act 2, and you get the more that you've been waiting for. Which brings me to the play Hamilton. Um, Hamilton. Probably, arguably, the most popular play that's out there now. Been on Broadway for the last couple of years. It's going on national tour, and I just looked it up. The first night that it's here in Minneapolis, Wednesday, August 29th, a single ticket is going to send you back 319 bucks. Ooh! I looked it up, too, just for comparison, because I like to have my facts straight. I could, honestly, guys, get two tickets to the Vikings-Packers game the Sunday after Thanksgiving at U.S. Bank Stadium, two tickets for the price of one ticket to Hamilton. All of a sudden now, that Vikings-Packers game seems like value to me, right? <laughs> you go to a play, and the beautiful thing is, once you get done with Act 1, that's not the end of the story. There's more to do, and we'll know why here in just a moment when it comes to the Hamilton tickets that I'm referring to. So we're to the book of Ephesians today. This letter that's written by Paul sometime around 62 AD, he's in prison, and it is a general letter. That is to say, he is not writing the book of Ephesians to one particular congregation per se in Ephesus. This is a letter that is intended to be a little bit more broad strokes in terms of what he's talking about. And it's intended, we think, that it was going to be shared among different congregations around the area. It's as if Paul wrote a letter to the Minnesota South District of the LCMS, of which we're a part, and he intended that letter to be read among all the congregations in the Minnesota South District. Um, the primary themes that Paul covers in the book of Ephesians, therefore, are a little bit more general than specific to any particular problem, and that is the themes that he's going after, the themes of unity and reconciliation through Jesus Christ. And so Act 1 of Ephesians, if you will, basically sets up something like this. He starts off, as Paul always does, with a greeting. He talks in chapter 1 about the spiritual blessings that we have because of Jesus Christ. He encourages those people in those Ephesian congregations for their faith in Jesus Christ, reminds them that they've been made alive in a new way 
in God's way because of what Christ has done for them. And therefore, because they are new creations because of what Christ has done, they now have unity. And this is the first time he mentions this unity in Christ. He will come back to it later on in the letter. But this time in chapter 2, it sets up as a prologue. And that's what we read in our lesson last week here at 930. He ends Act 1, if you will, with phrases like this that Lynn read just a moment ago. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you. He goes on and he says that you've been established in love, may have power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more, all that we can ask or imagine. And what ends up happening is this first act ends on this amazing crescendo, as plays tend to do. It ends with this soaring, inspiring, mountaintop experience. And here's the thing. You would think that what we just heard today is the end of the letter. And it's not. It's just the end of Act 1. And so it's as we get to the conclusion of our passage that we have before us today that the audience claps, it gets on its feet, and now we hit intermission. Because there is more to the book of Ephesians than what we just got today. Um, here's the thing. If you go to the August 29th uh, presentation of Ham Hamilton, um, you're going to pay $319 a ticket. That, by the way, my friends, I saw it. It was in the very back of the theater, about second row from the very back. That's going to set you back $638 before a tub of popcorn. Just for two of you to go out on date night. And so here's my thing. If you're going to lay out that kind of money to go see Hamilton, are you going to go to the first act of Hamilton and go, oh, that's amazing, and then head for home as soon as act one is done? No. I mean, sure, you can read on Wikipedia what act two is about, but that's not the point. You paid all this money to go see this thing, you're not going to leave halfway through the show and go, well, I'll just look it up on Wikipedia and figure out the rest. Yeah. That would be ludicrous. And so this is why the importance of this notion of intermission becomes so important to the book of Ephesians. Paul comes back in the second act of Ephesians, if you will. And what he does is he offers us a still more moving second act to the first act that he left off with, including things like, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you receive. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And when he says humble, he's talking about moral littleness. That is, be completely humble. That is to say, be absolutely little when it comes to your neighbor. Make yourself smaller so that they may be bigger. When it comes to gentle, he's talking about that mild kind of spirit. Doing this is not a mild spirit in Paul's sense. Be patient. We've talked about this in weeks past. Be long-suffering with the people around you. This right here, patience, is something we are sorely missing in our world these days. We are not long-suffering with anybody. We are short-suffering with them. Bear it with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. This is what he picks up again that he left off with in the first act. In, through the bond of peace. That is, peace for him is not just be, get along to be along. What's the phrase, people? Go along to get along. Thank you. That's what it was. It's not go along to get along. It's a spirit of looking for true concord. It's a spirit of looking for true harmony with others, even when you disagree. This is what he says. And then he continues on. Be imitators of God. Literally, that Greek word, mimetes, is literally like the mind. Be like a mom of God. Therefore, as dearly loved children, live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave us up as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. And then he completes with some, a very, very famous illustration that Paul uses a couple of times in the New Testament. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And he talks about these different pieces of armor that God has given us as a defense against Satan's schemes and Satan's wanting to bring us harm and draw us away from God. And so again, going to a play versus going to a movie, I would is a great form of entertainment. 
because going to a play versus going to a movie causes us to think in terms of what a play offers that a movie doesn't, and that can have a profound impact on our faith. And that, of course, is the intermission. It's a chance for us in the midst of our faith to stop what we're doing and to savor what it is that we've experienced, what God has given to us, and to just pause, to spend the proverbial 15 minutes taking a brief, taking stock of everything we've experienced, everything we've been told, share it with somebody else. Grab a bucket of popcorn while you're at it. You gotta eat. And then you go back in and you continue with the story. That idea of intermission is so important to our faith. Um, and what that intermission does for us, my friends, is I think three fundamental things when it comes to our faith. An intermission in terms of a play is a reminder to stick around because there's a lot more to be had. And that is true when it comes to our faith as well. These pauses that we take, prayer that we offer, the silence that we experience within worship at church, and sometimes even in worship, we sorely lack silence because why? We don't like it. If I stand up and I do prayers in the church and I pause for too long, don't raise your hand, you don't have to. But how many of you start to go, did he fall asleep up there? <laughs> Pastor, and if you ever hear me saying, da -da, da 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 Lord, in your mercy, and you say, hear our prayer, and then I pause for a minute, and then you start to hear me go, <laughs> then you know I have fallen asleep. But beyond that, I'm simply taking this intermission, I'm taking this pause for us to be able to save them what it is that we've experienced so far. The intermission of our faith is the same thing when it comes to Bible study and when it comes to worship. We come here on a Sunday morning, we worship for an hour and 17 minutes, um, sometimes an hour and 22 if you'll indulge me, and we go back out into the world. And sometimes we come back, and sometimes we don't. And friends, we are encouraged to keep coming back because guess what? The story's not done yet. The second act hasn't been played out yet. Same thing is true with Bible study. One of the things I thought was interesting, I went to district convention a couple weeks ago, and our denomination, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, is encouraging us as pastors and as congregations to do more when it comes to Bible study. Bible study has kind of fallen away from practice. The great thing, my friends, is you guys are already very, very much appreciating of Bible study. We host Bible study on most Sunday mornings after church, and depending on what we're doing, we've got 20 to 25 of you up there. Praise God. It's amazing. We have many of you who are committed to regular Bible study with each other throughout the week. Praise God. We never can forget how important it is to avail ourselves of those opportunities. To not, once we've heard something, a sermon, a Bible study, to go, you know what? I think I've had my fill of church now for about three weeks. No. Come back. Hear the story. Um, I just realized it because I got a letter from my seminary the other day. Um, I just celebrated my 20th year of ordination. It was kind of cool. And I didn't even realize it. I looked back at the calendar and the 20th anniversary of my ordination, guess what I was doing? Writing a sermon because it was a Thursday. Guys, one of the things I realized, and I kind of counted it up, I've been privileged as a pastor over the last 20 years to preach almost 1,000 sermons. <coughs> Here's the thing. I've preached almost 1,000 sermons. It never gets old. Ever. Sitting down every single week and having to trust that the Spirit is going to give me what the Spirit wants me to bring to you on Sunday, just as He has done again here today. Guess what, guys? The Spirit's never failed me. I've been doing this 20 years, and it never gets old. And on the contrary, my friends, those of you who I typically will spend Tuesday mornings in Bible study with, after a while, after doing Bible study with you guys for a year, I think I might run out of ideas. And I don't. And why? It's not because of me. It's because the Spirit is faithful. Amen? Amen. And this stuff never gets old old. It never gets tired. It never gets used up. You can spend your entire life, 24-7, 365, until the day you go back 
through the pearly gates, and here's the deal. You'll never exhaust it. You can't. It is God's living word that comes into our midst. And the thing is, just when you think you've had something, a mountaintop experience, clap, 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 intermission, I think I might leave. No, come back, because God's always got more for you. Amen? Amen. Something else that I think the intermission in a play reminds us of in terms of how we live our faith, too, is that the cost is too great for us to ever leave halfway through. You come back to Hamilton. You're going to pay 319 minimum, my friends, if you want to go down to the Orpheum and see that play. Raise your hand if you're going to drop 638 bucks, not including Ticketmaster taxes and all that kind of stuff, and leave halfway through. Raise your hand. You would? That'd be ludicrous. That'd be a waste. Guys, here's the thing. The same thing is true when it comes to our faith. The cost for the story that we continue to have before us every single day about what our God has done between the leather covers of that scripture has come at a cost. And that cost is way more expensive than 319 times two. That cost came at the cost of Jesus Christ crucified and risen for you. And so because God has paid that cost and the Ticketmaster search, you already have that paid for. Your seat is already covered. In my father's house, there are many rooms. And if it wasn't so, guess what? I wouldn't have even said anything to you. And so you have a place in the theater. You have your spot. And so the cost has been paid, and it's too great for us to leave halfway through and think we know the rest of the story. My friends, I encourage you, keep coming back. There's always something new. Pastor Fofana and I are constantly amazed at what little light bulbs go off in our heads in terms of what we're led to preach by the Holy Spirit. Constantly amazed as what we are led to do. Literally, my friends, epiphanies every single day in terms of walking into a Bible study and going, I didn't see that coming, but here you go. Tuesday morning, friends, if I've ever walked in and gone, you know, it was a little surprising, but here we are. This is what our God has done for us. He has paid a price. And so it's too great for us to read halfway through and say, I got it. I'll go to Wikipedia and get the right. Um, and intermission is a reminder, too, I think, to make good use of that proverbial 15 minutes. We go out in an intermission between a play. We use lavatory. We grab popcorn. We talk to somebody about what's going on. Um, the important thing about our faith, too, is that we use that downtime. And we use it wisely. When we don't have the middle, when we're not in the middle of worship, when we're not in the middle of a Bible study, take that intermission. Talk to other people about the story that you've just experienced. Talk to people about what you've seen, about what you've heard. Share with them the way the Lord is working in your life. Just today, my friends, let me give you a little taste. Rosemary and I are driving to church. Now, this is the first time since I've been your pastor that Rosemary and I have driven to church together. That is to say, it's the first time that I got here around 9 o'clock, not around 7 o'clock. Why is that important? Because I don't think it was a coincidence that as Rosemary and I are driving south on Highway 169 away from our house, there's a guy walking in the median of 169. You don't walk in the highway especially 169. And he's carrying a backpack. And you know what's sticking out of his backpack? A huge cross. I'm saying it. What's going on with that guy? What is that guy's story that he's lumbering northward along the left-hand median of 169 carrying a backpack with about a four-foot cross sticking out of it? I don't know. I didn't have the guts to turn the car around and stop on 169 and ask him. But you guys, this kind of stuff is happening all the time. And these are the kinds of things that in our downtime we're called to share with people. Because guys, we don't know how the Holy Spirit can use this stuff. Amen? Amen. I tell you a story about a guy walking with a backpack and a cross. Spirit's going to do what the Spirit wants to do, and maybe that provides inspiration for your faith. I don't know, because I'm not in charge of it. That's the Spirit's prerogative. But what I'm in charge of, my friends, what all of us are in charge of, is to see those little moments and to tell that stuff, to hide it under a bushel. No! I'm going to let it shine. To use that in-between time 
to witness to what's going on, to what the Lord is doing. And so it's way better than a movie. <coughs> going to a play, having intermission, provides all kinds of blessings and positives that going to the movie doesn't. And it's the same thing when it comes to our faith. Because as we take advantage of those intermissions in our faith lives, what ends up happening? When the curtain ends up closing, we end with the words that Paul ends this letter to the Ephesians with. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. The Lord be with you. Amen. Amen.